Welcome to AIDIA Talk, where we delve into the dynamic world of foreign policy and international affairs. Join us as we explore insight and also have constructive dialogue on the global stage brought to you by the Asian Institute of Diplomacy and International Affairs, strategically based and broadcast in the heart of Himalayas, Kathmandu, Nepal. Today, we are pleased to welcome a very special, rather distinguished guest to AIDIA Talk. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Calvin St. Juste, who is the Special Envoy to the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, and he oversees uh, development, international business relations, and also investment in the Caribbean. Looking forward to have a very engaging conversation with His Excellency. Welcome to AIDIA Talk. Thank you, thank you. Namaste. Namaste and welcome to Nepal as well. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank Let's start off on a lighter note. Your first impression about Nepal. What were your thoughts and in reality, as you're here, well, what it is to you? I think first impression, because of the geographical location, I was surprised with the weather. I anticipated it would have been a little hot. <laughs> <laughs> so upon coming, I don't think I came as prepared as I should have um, with the, 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 the quiet attire. So, um, so I think that was rather surprising in terms of the, the, the cold, as it has um, I've realized in terms of location-wise. Well, as we record today, apparently it's the coldest day in Kathmandu, Nepal, but uh, let's look forward to a warm conversation, shall we? Now, uh, St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, captivating dual island nation with a population just of just 50,000. Now, a lot of people in Nepal or our audience might not know about the country in the Caribbean because it's, it's less heard of, perhaps, in this part of the world. Tell us about uh, St. Kitts and Nevis. Absolutely. I, I would say <clears throat> perhaps the, the closest thing you would probably align is the West Indies which yes. is known from a cricket. cricket. So I would start there. <laughs> that sort of brings us home together. So St. Kitts and Nevis, as indicated, it is the eight smallest countries in, in the, the Western Hemisphere. Um, we have been through a number of um, journeys in terms of being part of a colonization um, approach, whether it's from the, the British, French, and also um, from a, the Spanish side of things. The island is a tropical island, and if you think about the tropical island that you most likely would have seen, it is exactly what it says. You have the blue waters. The blue waters. You have the white sandy, sandy beaches. beaches. <laughs> and the lush green landscape. And the lush green landscape. <laughs> so we, we carry that as part of who we are as, as a country. Um, we have a sort of saying that we may be small, but we're tall. In, in different ways. We have a big voice on the world um, put, put, footprint, so to speak, in terms of what we have been able to achieve. Um, interesting facts that you may or may not know, and this is something that we, we always talk about. So for example, Alexander Hamilton, mm. who is <clears throat> one of the founding fathers of the United States, actually came from um, our federation and the country of, uh, the island of Nevis where he was born. So oh, many wow. people may not be aware of that. So we always say, we tell the US that we gave you, um, you know, you know Alexander one of your Hamilton, founding yes. fathers, founding Alexander fathers. Um, Hamilton. Now that you're in Nepal, uh, what are the similarities do you, do you see? Um, of course, Nepal is a Himalayan country, whereas the Caribbean, it's, it's the island, you know, it's, it's the tropical region. But in terms of economy, in terms of culture, community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, are there any similarities that we share? Yes, quite a bit, actually. I think what I have seen, even though we are, from a distance perspective, we have a number of things alike. One of the key things is the mountainous, majestic side that we, we all carry. Our mountains may not be as big as yours, but we are clearly have mountains. Have mountains. <laughs> and with that, what we see is some of the challenges as well. Um, yeah, the Prime Minister, the Honorable Dr. Terence Drew, um, has made a very bold statement in that St. Kitts and Nevis is 
moving towards a transformation of a sustainable island state. And what does that mean, you know, a, a tiny island moving to a sustainable island state, similar <clears throat> to the aspect of what we see the challenge that Nepal has where the glaciers are melting. No fault of ours, <laughs> but we have to deal with it. We don't have glaciers, but what we have is the rising of the, 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 the sea level. We have the challenges of hurricanes. And, in and protecting the corals and the reefs. As part of our, our journey into sustainable islands, it, that is key. Our blue economy. How do we ensure that we protect the coral reef? How do we ensure our maritime um, economies are preserved? Which also leads into food sustainability and food security on, on our end. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a lot of people in Nepal might know much about St. Kitts and Nevis, but it's, it's a surprising fact that uh, it stands on the fifth position when it comes to FDI, the investments coming in from St. Kitts and Nevis. And uh, another similarity that I see is I think both the countries uh, primarily depended on tourism for, for the income of the country, for mm -hmm. the GDP of the country. Uh, your takes on that, sir? I think I, I'll step back a bit. <clears throat> so St. Kitts has been going through a number of transformation. We started with the sugar industry, which was a, a monocultural approach. And then we transformed and moved forward into the tourism aspect of things. And similar to, to Nepal, I, I think where we see there's a key dependency on our ecotourism um, concept. That is a great opportunity for us to do well. But I think where we saw the fragility of it is during the COVID um, time. And I think what we have seen for us, we see the value of very high end uh, tourists. tourists that comes to the, the Caribbean, most of St. Kitts, whether it's from a cruise perspective here. From a Nepal perspective, it's really around what I classify as that mental wellness mm. aspect, the trekking through to the mountains. Those are key areas to, imp to really help with the foreign direct investment. But we have to also think further around the diversification. We cannot just simply just rely on one area. And so for us, which I think is similar for Nepal, is how do we diversify um, into different economies to uh, obviously we lead into additional investments. Mm -hmm. Now, regarding the same, same topic, uh, mm -hmm. what really uh, took my interest is citizenship by investment. Uh, it came in 1984, a year after independence from the United Kingdom. How much of, of investment did it attract? Uh, what is the state of this policy? How much has it has St. Kitts and Nevis yielded from this policy? So we, we saw as a small island state that we had to really think of innovative ways for us to attract additional um, investment. And so we went to the transformation of implementing this very unique program, uh, which became what we call uh, across the globe, um, the golden <coughs> um, visa process. And that opened up a number of opportunities that we saw that we can have a win-win on both sides where we have individuals who wish to contribute, to make a contribution to the growth, to the economy. And in return for that, they then get what we call getting a piece of the rock, mm -hmm. uh, getting, additional, uh, getting a, a additional citizenship um, that benefits them in, in different ways. That program generated a significant number of revenue. Um, and as you know, when you have a program that has a greater appetite and needs. Uh, unfortunately, it attracted um, some bad actors that we did not wish to have. And as such, you know, the, the, the prime minister and the cabinet made a very bold um, decision that we will rebrand, we will transform, um, we will re-energize the program, and that took place last year. And the reason why we took very, very bold and very decisive measure, measures to really revamp the program, really put very restrictive <coughs> approach in it, it was our brand. We wanted to ensure that that brand is protected. We, had, we have a premium country, we have a premium brand in, in, in who we are, and so we took that bold statement in terms of revamping our CBI system. So the program did help diversify 
the economy and bring in investments to the country. What are the areas that we're looking at majorly? The other areas, we, we, we continually explore ways, as I said, our um, ecotourism, one area that we are also exploring. The other aspect is an, our agricultural aspect. Uh, we see there is, you know, we have fertile land in sinkets. We have a, 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 an interesting joke that you, you, you drop something on and it, it just simply grows. Something like the Tarai of <laughs> Nepal. You, you drop anything and it grows. <laughs> and it grows. But before we can actually go to the external side, we need to make sure that we can sustain ourselves. And so food security is, is critical. So we are seeing an aspect of how can we use innovation, how can we use um, the advancement of new gen technology in our agriculture, whether it's you know, smart farming, biodiversity uh, farms, to really begin the, 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 the production of different um, type of uh, agricultural needs and products um, mm -hmm. for the country. Very interesting because uh, when I was growing up, we, we studied Nepal as a primarily an ag agricultural country. But now, as I see, more lands are barren. Mm -hmm. More lands have turned into a real estate property. But I also see a great number of youngsters who went abroad, studied, came back, and now chose to be farmers. And they have their new technology that, that they're using uh, for a higher production of goods from the same area of land you know so in place of tomatoes it's rather kiwis or avocados it's yielding higher but how much of a challenge was it to bring the literacy when it came to using technology in the old methods when it came to agriculture in St. Kitts and Nevis was it a challenge because it's not very easy to change the mindset you know that is the most difficult thing I, I think it's it's a journey I would use the word, it's a journey, and you're absolutely right. Um, and I think Nepal faces the same uh, transition, where you have the traditional farmers who have been farming and using the traditional methods for many, many years and yielded many, 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 many outputs. But that creates a challenge where you, can, you have a limited number of land space. And so we are now really lo looking at an opportunity where we can use less land, but produce more. more. And with that, that is now the introduction of uh, bringing innovation, bringing, you know, I, I mentioned smart farming, using technology, the advancement of technology to grow things faster, but, use, but using less land use. We're seeing an open-mindedness to it. We, you know, there's continuous workshops. Um, we always look at ways we can continually bring both our traditional farming <laughs> expert, but also the new and innovative together. So it's not one supersides the other. It's how can they maintain a complementary It's the synchronicity approach. of the both, yes. old and new. Now, uh, let's talk about the current relationship Nepal and St. Kitts and Nevis holds, because we might not know. As I mentioned earlier, I was surprised to, to learn the fact that it is the fifth uh, highest investment that is coming to Nepal. And uh, so what are the current relationships basis that we share as two nations, which are pulled apart, yes, <laughs> but so well connected? Yeah, I think the, the, the interesting thing, and you, you said it perfectly, it's because there's an undercurrent of connection. I use the word the connective tissue. Connective tissue, interesting. <laughs> uh, the connective tissue that we share. Um, you know, we see the, the many opportunities to partner um, in many, many different ways. You know, we, we talk about ways where we can provide a level of access to different markets, and likewise, um, Nepal opens up a new opportunity for us to have access um, to new markets as well. The other areas that we are, we are sort of seeing is is the the, the partnership in in cultural exchange um, programs, where we can have a, what I call cross pollination um, of friendship and ideas, <laughs> <laughs> uh, cross pollination of intellectual. Uh, um, best practices and to your point ideas uh, yeah I, I think there is so much that we can share there's so much that we have together um, the ecotourism we talked about that before which is a major area um, that we can 
also cross market. You know, we have in we have over a million uh, tourists <coughs> will be hidden, and we can share after you've had a wonderful um, beverage at the <laughs> beach, um, and you've enjoy the the white sand the beach. You may want to go through what I classify as that mental wellness and think through it. We can promote Nepal to that population. And likewise, we you know, would love for Nepal to do the same, where individuals are trekking into the mountains and having that wonderful sort of um, open ear. And now they can now have an opportunity to see, well, you can now come to the white sandy beaches and enjoy the Caribbean. Mm. Um, as well. There's a term that is very popular in, in recent years. Uh, instead of global, we call it global. <laughs> Uh, how much of belief do you put into this word? Because yes, uh, over 200 countries in the world, you know, we were separated by borders. But if you look at it as a whole, from outer space, it's one planet that we share. Uh, your ideas, thoughts on it, the word "global," and how much does it really mean to you? <laughs> it, it, it means a lot. We, we share one planet. That is very important, and I think that's where we all have to realize that we share one planet. And what happens in the Western Hemisphere, in that tiny little Caribbean country of Federation, St. Kitts and Nevis, potentially has ripple effect to The butterfly Nepal, effect. <laughs> to Nepal, and likewise. Right. And I think this is where, you know, the, the Prime <clears throat> Minister, as I said, he's made a bold statement. And he has really taken it upon uh, taking us on a journey to demonstrate that we can truly become a sustainable island state. We can truly have a major impact in the fact that we have a 55, 60,000 uh, population and you have a 30 million. Yes. <laughs> but we all share the same challenges. We all share the, the potentially the benefits. So we are connected in that way. And so we see the opportunities are endless to open our hands of friendship, open our hands of economic partnership. Mm -hmm. And if we stand together, it opens us up to really do wonderful things, um, you know, as nations, as independent sovereign um, countries. Mm -hmm. Now you've had a, a series of high-level meetings mm -hmm. in Nepal, from the Deputy Prime Minister to the Labour Minister. How did those meetings go? Are we expecting a fruitful collaboration in the near future? Yes, I would say we are expecting a continuous, continuous, <laughs> continuous yes. collaboration. I think, you know, the, the, the warm welcome that I've received, it's unparalleled. I, you know, unfortunately, I do have to leave, but I, I think it was very clear on the fact that we, all, we agree that we face the same challenge. You know, when I met the different ministers, it was very clear on the level of cooperation that we can, we can work together. We see there's economic um, benefits that we can share, and we, we touch on a, a few of, of those areas. Mm -hmm. But there's a willingness, there's a, an open hand of, we are here to partner. We see there's certain things that you can bring to the table and likewise we know there's certain things that Nepal can bring to the table for us. Right. So I, 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 as I said, I don't think this would be my last visit. Um, there is going to be a continuous cooperation and collaboration between the, the two countries. Hopefully you come back soon <laughs> and explore the diverse geography of the country. Now, let's talk about the youth. Mm. Very important, crucial, integral part of any country. There was a time when, when people and leaders would say youth are the future of the country, but no, they are the present of the country. In Nepal, I'll, I'll tell you the scenario what we have is, now a lot of youngsters, they travel abroad uh, looking for a better life, better opportunity, and we see a lot of youth leaving the country. Mm. Is this a scenario that is similar to St. Kitts and Nevis, or do you believe that a person can be anywhere in the world and yet contribute to a nation's growth. I am a prime example <laughs> of an individual who may not have both feet in, in St. Kitts and Nevis, um, but I'm clearly contributing at a significant um, level. One of the key things, and I think this is a journey that we saw, and I think this is perhaps what Nepal is saying, seen as well, 
is we encourage our, our, the younger generation to go out and explore and bring that talent, bring, bring back that intellectual capacity and insight to help grow the mm -hmm. economy. And that's obviously, I would call it the academic approach, but the reality is what we now have to accept. We may have individuals that may be outside of the country from a physical perspective, but they can contribute and make significant end roads. And what we are now doing, and this is again based on, I think, the innovation of, of the Prime Minister, is tap into our diaspora. A huge innovation, a huge impactful group of our diaspora who has done wonderful things. And I think, and likewise, from Nepal, your diaspora has done an amazing job and has been the, the ambassadors to the world. And they'll, they're looking to contribute. And I think it's creating those avenues. We have you know, what we call the, the Prime Minister's Lecture. And this is an innovative approach where we reach out to individuals who have done amazing things in the diaspora to come and speak and tell us, tell the nation certain what they've things, learned, what, what they've, they've learned, um, in teaching certain ways. We also have the aspect of giving the diaspora the opportunity to invest back into the country, whether it's from foundations, whether it's contributing from a tangible or intangible medical supply or even your medical services. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an appetite there's an appetite for the diaspora who they were looking for that opportunity. The only thing we did which was different, we opened our hands and said, come. So we didn't need both feet in the island. Mm -hmm. But we know your heart, which is one heart, is there. And no matter where you are abroad, we know the doors that were still always, always open. Open. Always open. Wow, that's an interesting take. Mm -hmm. Now, you've also served as the chief operating officer and head of global strategy at Morgan Stanley Wealth Management, financial wellness sector. <laughs> that, is, that is quite a handful that I had to read it out, you know, but uh, financial literacy, let's start off with the basics mm. that people understand because we, we really wish that our audience, our spectators, uh, the youngsters who are trying to understand, of course, the foreign policy, international affairs that there mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. but a bigger part of it, a chunk of it, the economics revolves around finance. Yes. Financial literacy normally for a person comes with age and experience, let's say in their 30s. The concept of saving, the concept of money, how does money grow from what you have, all of this. How important do you think is financial literacy? Because that is something not taught in schools unless you choose to study it in, as a graduate. Which, you know, I think that what we have seen, and I think it's the, the same thing, is there is a fear of talking about money at a very young age. There tends to be that fear of opening up that conversation around saving, around budgeting, around investing. And so we have seen, and likewise anticipate what happened in, in, in Nepal, is there's that level of fear because I may not be aware of everything. I have been in the financial uh, world um, I always joke around it where I've served individuals who had one dollar <laughs> and I've <laughs> as, served as savings? <laughs> one dollar and I've served individuals who have billion dollars. And the key thing that I see is what I, it's my term, it is the reverence of money. And I've seen the individual who started, and that's the key word, with that one dollar. And they demonstrate a level of reverence of that financial aspect. And it grows because one plus one is two and you demonstrate three. And I've seen individuals in my investment time, and I call it the Friday, Monday tra tra tragedy. Friday, <laughs> Monday tragedy. Yes, Friday, Monday. Friday, you are worth X amount of millions of dollar network. You yeah, have good instability for the <laughs> in the market and that wipes everything away because you didn't really plan appropriately. Right. And that creates a very negative approach. So a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck. 
there's with, a concept. With no plan. There's a concept of paycheck to paycheck because, as you said, the financial literacy has not been something that's part of who we are. It's, it's never been addressed. Now, how you've been in the sector, you've, you know the importance of financial literacy. How important is it for a nation to address it? Let's say, let's say if, if there is a national mm -hmm. policy that says, okay, let's teach our generation, the young kids, from the very beginning about what money is, how do you save it, how do you make it grow? Do you, don't you think that is an investment you are doing to a whole bunch of generation that will perhaps lead the country one day. How well, important is it on, on a, <laughs> to be addressed on a national level? We have taken that leap. In St. Kitts and Nevis? In St. Kitts. So in our 2024 budget, we have taken a bold statement and what we've said, we've introduced as a, as a government program, uh, financial literacy. And we've moved further and said, we don't wish for it just to be an academic term. We are actually going to put our money where our mouth is. And we are going to invest $1,000 in every single child at the age of 5 to 18. And within that $1,000, we are then going to take $500 and invest <coughs> that into um, locally owned companies. That changes the concept where could you imagine a five-year-old having a conversation at the kitchen table that, hey, mom and dad, the government is <laughs> giving me <laughs> I can't $1, imagine that. Dollars, but they're taking 500. No, they're not taking away that 500. This is to help grow. They're planting a seed. So in the next 20, 30 years, as we invest, and we invest in, in our own economy, we invest in, in the companies that actually help uh, build our economy. By the time you reach of age, you're now going to like see seventeen the or eighteen. You you world. know how the world works. You know how the economy works, and how to turn it around on your favor. Interesting. Now investments. Uh, uh, Saint Saint Kitts and Nevis. It's a small dual island mm -hmm. nation. Uh, so is Nepal, a small uh, country. Given the fact that we have huge neighbors, India and China. I think that is why a lot of people think we're a small nation. But if you dive into the geography, the diversity, it's actually a very big nation. Uh, but as a country, what should be a country's priority, especially a nation small with big neighbors? What should be the priority of investment for a country like Nepal, with your experience? I always say, and again, we, we use these gigantic a country, we use nations, we use you know, sovereign state. It's a home. And the first thing is that with inside of the home. So you have to invest first at home. And once you have the infrastructure, once you have the, the, the building blocks within the, the, the home, within Nepal, uh, the infrastructure, then you begin from inside out, because that's very important. The foundation, you know, we talk about the infrastructure, <clears throat> we talk about um, investing in the people, we talk about investing in the growth of the economy. What are your competitive advantage? It's, mm. it's, it's this key thing. Look at your competitive advantage and how do you diversify in those areas? And how do you be innovative? We're in a world, you know, I always laugh because I, I'm, I'm in, also in, in technology. Last year, or she said November of, um, of 2022, the whole concept of AI and chat GPT came onto the, the, the forefront. Hmm. It's only a couple months and it is pretty much the foundation of where the world is. So we have to be ready to take on the digital innovation. We have to think of innovative ways that we can use you know, the core um, competitive advantage that we have. Nepal is in the perfect um, spot. I call it, it's, it's in the right spot. <laughs> because it's now, you, you know, you, as I walk and drive along the, the, the area, you can feel the vibration and not 
a bad vibration. It's a vibration of it is ready to explode. And you said it perfectly. It's between two of the leading <laughs> economies in the world. Uh, and so how can you take full advantage of yeah. that? And I think there's so much to step back, start with the core foundation of you know, the building blocks that you need for the economy. And then you start to go outside. You then look at your competitive advantage. What makes Nepal unique? What gives us that, um, that unique viewpoint that the world wishes to come? That, and this is what we've done in St. Kitts and Nepal. And it has worked wonderfully. It has worked wonderfully. Wow, okay. Let's talk about one of the many hats that you wear. One of them is your expertise in telecommunications, but then transcended to telemedicine. Now, it is a perfect, perhaps a perfect adaptation and a revolutionary step for a country like Nepal, mm -hmm. where the geography at one point is the beauty, the uniqueness of the country. At the same time, it is also a barrier for people and the possibilities that may happen. Because, you know, we have the mountains, we have the hills, the Tharai, uh, with limited number of, number of health workers and experts how do you think telemedicine could work in Nepal? Do we need a lot of investment? Because we, I think we already have technology, which is telecommunications. But to start off telemedicine in Nepal, what are the steps Nepal could easily take? The, the, the concept, when I was in that um, industry, it was, it was rather interesting because, and this was done in, 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 in the US when we first began the whole concept of telemedicine, teleneurology, which is a little bit more um, specialist type of, of, of healthcare service. What I saw specifically, and, and Nepal is facing this, and you said it perfectly, was in the area, the rural areas, where um, we were not able to provide to a number of the communities those specialized. You have the foundation already. You have the desire to do it. The investment is not significant. It is, as I'll make it very basic. Maybe break it down <laughs> for us. It is putting together a, a, a foundational center and then transmitting it, which requires a monitor, and then you... It's internet connection? And internet connection. You have that, and that individual now can create a consultation, a medical consultation. The same way we have our phones. It's like, it's like calling your mother and saying hi. <laughs> you said it perfectly. It is calling your mother and saying, huh? not hi, but mom, I have a cold. And well, she's telling you She'll tell you what to, what do, to do, what drink to make, you know, <laughs> and, and take the magic potion. But what were the initial challenges when you first introduced this in the U.S.? I'm sure there were some challenges because... Uh, we are humans. Mm -hmm. we, we need that human touch. Mm -hmm. Like for me, a doctor has to be, maybe not for me, but for my mother, a doctor has to be a real person. Mm -hmm. If I tell her, okay, you just video call this person and you know, he or she is going to give you the advice that you need for your back or your knee, I don't think she's going to believe it. Was this a challenge yes. when you first initiated this program in the US? Yes, when I got into that space and the company that I was part of, which is a startup company, that was one of the main areas we saw was the education. We saw similar to what we talked about earlier of the traditional farming and the new um, individuals were not accepting. Um, while I was part of that industry, even the American Medical Association told us at that point in time, it would be very, you know, it would not be a very sustainable business model because people traditionally wants to feel and touch their physician. Fast forward, COVID came. Oh, yes. And what did we see happen? The all transition. Of sudden, all of a sudden, we're distancing. <laughs> the transition created the opportunity for that it is desire. So for Nepal, it is there. I think you have to, my concept on everything I've done in, in my I bought my, 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 my career and, 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 and my, my, my service to my country is pilot. The key word is pilot. You would be surprised what a pilot does. Because once you pilot something, it actually grows. It grows. So just pilot it and then 
it, you would see the food and the growth. Let it take its course. Its course. Interesting. Now, uh, lastly, the, one of the last few questions that I have, because this is a very engaging conversation. I wish we could go on and on, but uh, it's a data-driven world mm -hmm. right now. The world is hungry for data. There are countries already capitalizing on the data that they have, using it to the best of the benefits for as a nation and for the people as well. Uh, your take on the data-driven world, how do you see the future that we have uh, where everything runs on the basis of data? Is it going to work heavily on the favor of the world or is it going to be something that we should perhaps be aware of? Uh, one of the other many hats I wore was um, in, in cybersecurity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so as you, you mentioned data, my, my, my brain shift, um, we can't get away from it. You know, the minute you enter this world, data is given to you. You are now classified as it, whether it's your social security, your health number, whatever. You, the, you're given a, a specific numerical um, connection. I think it's where we have to accept it. We, you know, the concept of data mining is critical. We have to be aware of it. Uh, I think there's an, there's an appetite that we've seen that a number of bad actors can get. Uh, as you probably have seen globally, there's so many um, cyber attacks that has been yes. happening. And with those cyber attacks, your information is openly exposed. Data can help. You know, one of the unique things we are exploring in our economy is understanding, uh, specifically in tourism, is our, the spend of our, our client, our customers, our tourists, um, and understand what is important for them. So you can use data in, a, in an amazing way, where as long as you're, you're collecting it the right way, you can then see the, the patterns, you can then pro, you know, present what people are thinking about before they even ask about it. What is the future that that data holds? The possibility that perhaps we're not being able to think of as well. What is the greatest boon that data could give into maximizing how we how we function in this world? It anticipate it gives you the opportunity to anticipate before you even thought think about it. That's true. Yes. If you have that ability and if you are able to do that. Almost like a superpower. Super, it, it, it just becomes a superpower. I go back to the whole concept of chat GPT. We would never have thought that you put basic stuff and here you are. You now have access to almost the minds of millions of people coming to you in one single app. Mm -hmm. So data gives you that ability, natural language processing. It's an amazing tool. This is where you can actually leverage it and give you a solve the competitive. Does it also help us predicting a certain kind of economy of the world where it's leading? It can, to some degree. It, it will give you, you know, predictive analytics to some level. It gives you, it can give you um, what we call early warning signs, you know, I think there's different ways, it's how you use it. I think the aspect is what is, first you have to understand why, and from there then you can then create whatever you so desire. Because it can be a preventative warning tool in terms of um, certain areas, you know, for us, in terms of where we see certain patterns and we anticipate um, certain um, geographical um, <coughs> forecasting, we can mm -hmm. create some early warning. It has consumer benefits as well. And then, and to your point, it also can provide an, an, an appetite to understand where things are going. It gives you that advantage to do what? Offer something before you actually think about it. Well, thank you so much for a lovely conversation. Before we leave, now you've been in Nepal for just a few days, but uh, to our Nepali audience watching this, is there anything that you would like to send in as a message, short and sweet one? <laughs> First off, thank you for having me. Thank you for your open and warmness. Uh, I think you know, Nepal is ready. Nepal, it is the right time. Take full advantage of it. We are a connected tissue. Distance may create uh, a challenge at first, but once we realize that we're actually closer together, we see the partnership and the collaboration that we can make. So all I would definitely say is thank you for having me and see you soon.
See you soon. On that note, thank you so much for giving us your valuable time. Thank I feel you. that is the greatest gift a human can give to the other one. Thank you so much for joining us in this special episode of AIDIA Talk. We'll see you on the other one. Until then, take care.